So, thank you. Um, so, uh, great, uh, great to have you all here today. Thank you all for coming. And um, uh, Valerie, if you want to take it away, I think we can get going, and then um, we'll have uh, some opportunity for further discussion. If you want to pull the agenda up, just so people have it at their disposal quickly, or however you wanted to do this, works for me. Um, so I can quickly just uh, run through the agenda and then we'll get started. All right, great. Um, so first I have some uh, general PEP project updates. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce new staff that we have here at PEP, um, updates on our fish passages. Uh, Mike Botini will go ahead and give us an otter update. Uh, then we will have a Broad Cove land acquisition update from Julie Wesnowski um, at the Pecanic Land Trust. Um, we will have a nitrogen and septic replacement update from Julia Priolo. And um, then we'll get into some discussion questions um, regarding fertilizer, uh, what we want our messaging on, on use to be, um, as well as some discussion questions um, going forward with um, events that we'll have this year. Um, so to get us started. Um, so you know me, if you don't, uh, my name is Valerie Vergona. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Peconic Estuary Partnership. Um, I have a background in environmental and public health advocacy uh, in the nonprofit realm. I'm very excited to get started. I've loved my last uh, few months here. Um, so then I'll go ahead and uh, introduce our two newer staff members. Um, Sarah, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Cernadas and I'm the new Water Quality Program Manager. I have a Master in Science and a PhD in Marine and Atmospheric Science. And I'm super excited to be working here with uh, the Piconeca Soil Partnership and, you know, helping improve uh, everything, right, in the Bay. Thank you, Sarah, welcome. Okay, and Jade, you can go ahead. Hi, everyone, I'm Jade. Uh, University for Coastal Science, Marine Science. I spent the last two years working for the Central Pine Barrens Commission. And so now I'm excited to be back in the water. And yeah, I'm the PEP Program Support Specialist. So any, anything you need help with. Thank you, Jay. Hey, hey, Valerie. I know, I know you have just figured out, but I, um, if Julie or the folks from the Land Trust have any pressing issues, or if Julia have any pressing issues where advancing them on the agenda might help, I, I, as a courtesy, you just consider that and ask them. Okay, sure. Uh, Julie, I know you're on the call. Do you have a time constraint? No, actually, I'm, I'm good. Thank you, though. Okay, sure. And I don't think that Julia is on the call just yet. Okay, okay. Okay, sure. I just didn't want anybody to think Mike Potini got special treatment and nobody else was worthy of the same offer. The whole thing's going to be good, folks. Stay on. <laughs> um, all right, so then we have a... Um, uh, soon a call going out through Stony Brook for a natural resources program manager. So that's very exciting. There'll be more of our like habitat um, and wildlife uh, specialty projects. Okay, um, so going into some PEP updates. Um, as you probably know, we are getting some infrastructure funding um, through the bill, as they're calling it. Um, and these are going to go directly towards projects. Um, these three projects have been approved by PEPS Management Committee and will soon go to a vote in the Policy Committee. Um, at the end of March is when the EPA funds are expected to open up. So these will be um, ongoing projects throughout the year and most likely next year. Um, very exciting, um, mostly dealing with um, storm water. So we have Meeting House Creek in Riverhead, um, that's a wetland restoration construction. That'll be about 600,000 uh, through infrastructure funding. And uh, New York State Assemblywoman Jody Giglio has actually dedicated the last 50,000, which is really amazing and generous. Uh, true Riverhead uh, person. So then we have Sag Harbor, a non-point source pollution stormwater management plan. 
This will be helping uh, Sag Harbor build out um, this plant to deal with their storm water. Um, and there are several locations listed here that specifically will have green infrastructure projects built in. Valerie, um, I, I hate to I hate to interrupt you. I mean, I really hate to, but we are stuck on a screen that looks like it isn't moving forward. And it's got somebody's entire screen, not just the presentation screens. Sure. Thank you. Okay, are you seeing bipartisan infrastructure law here? Yes, yes, we are. Okay, let me know if it's not moving forward. And sorry about that, folks. Um, so then the last of the three projects is the Town of Southhold Goose Creek Subwatershed uh, Discharge Elimination Plan. So Goose Creek uh, in Southhold is a pet priority area. And um, this would eliminate um, three outfalls into um, Goose Creek, which will help the health of that uh, creek as well as the uh, conic in that region. Okay. And these are, these are stormwater outfalls of sorts? Right? Correct, yeah. Okay. okay, are we seeing the next page? No. No. Interesting. <laughs> there it is. There you go. Okay. Um, so these are pet projects that are happening now. Um, some that were uh, just listed um, under progress. We have Broad Meadow uh, Now River Wetland Restoration, Indian Island County Park West, uh, Wetland Restoration, Paul Stoutenberg, which is very exciting, that wetland restoration project, Akabonic Harbor. Um, we have, of course, Woodhull listed here, which I'll go into a little bit more later. Uh, Meeting House Creek, as I mentioned, uh, our eelgrass restoration work group um, will be convening, um, and uh, the Pecanic Ecosystem Study, and of course, our Wildlife Monitoring Network um, with our partners at SeaTuck. All right. Are we seeing the next page? No. No. There it is. But it, we're also seeing the entire screen with the index on the left. Um, so then, let me see. We're seeing the whole header. Okay. You want to go to slides? As if yeah, so this in the main. I'm going to slideshow here on the bottom, but I'm going to take the whole page. Let's see. Sorry about this, folks. Is it taking up the whole page now? Not, Not yet. yet. All right. So I'm just going to continue like this because it looks yeah. like page under mine but sorry about that i'll figure it out before our next one <laughs> seems to be a theme with me i'll get it right next time guys um all right so then we have a pep project update um coming soon okay Ooh. so our water quality report um last year we had our inaugural report and we'll be working on that once again um tracking system and GIS database. Um, our critical land protection strategy, we'll be doing outreach and education on that. Hydrogen load reduction assessment, solute transport model. Uh, the USGS station will be built on Shelter Island. And uh, lastly, Greenport sewer expansion. Um, some of our goals for this current year and moving forward, we're going to be um, focusing on specific areas. Uh, those include uh, nutrient reduction and harmful algal blooms, uh, climate adaptation and shoreline hardening, uh, and continued education and outreach. Um, so some updates uh, for Woodhull Dam Fish Passage. Uh, I know this is long in the works and everybody has been um, really excited for this project and it's finally got underway um, last uh, December. So we have on the left from a few weeks ago, a picture from Chris Paparo. He did a um, drone flyover, which is really, really neat. Um, and on the right, we have a picture from the beginning of last week that the um, construction company sent over to PEP. 
Um, so as far as the um, timeline goes for this, it is going to be further into the spring than we expected. Um, so likely will not be um, active for uh, this fish run, uh, which is disappointing, but um, we will have an unveiling later on in the season, season that will be um, to be determined and we'll keep you guys posted on that. Um, and next year, it'll be ready for the fish run and that will be very exciting. We'll have some events based on that as well. And Valerie, and uh, I stopped by this <clears throat> middle of the day today and they had put the coffer dam uh, upstream of the of the dam. So they're making progress in that respect. Uh, they were pumping water. I'm not sure where they where they stood. <clears throat> uh, it's nice that they're sharing photos with us. Yeah. And I hope they can continue to do that because it's impossible to get a good view of what they're doing and how they're doing it. Uh, it'd be nice to capture that for posterity. So, yes. so, so, so the relevance of this, just so for some people that are that might not have the background, is this a big deal? And has this been hard to do? And is this a uh, historic and nearly almost important moment? As most of the 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 barriers, you know, I think we have one barrier left to break after twenty years. Brian, if you give people the short story, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I, for those who don't know me, I'm Byron Young. I'm a retired marine biologist, retired chief of marine fisheries. I've been working on river herring restoration in the Peconic since 1995. Um, this project is a big deal in that it opens up access to Wildwood Lake and the Cranberry Bog Preserve. Um, and fish have been coming to the base of this dam since the rock ramp was put in at Grangible Park. Um, and fish have been lifted over the dam bucket brigade for 20 years. So yes, having these fish be able to navigate the dam on their own is a great success. Um, and we'll hear more about the main stem of the Peconic a little bit later, but this, in my opinion, is the home run. Byron, is it possible that they could get uh, all the way into uh, Wildwood Lake? Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. They do that. The fish that we put over the top of the dam have been seen in Wildwood Lake. Um, Todd Gardner, who was a teacher at Suffolk Community College in Riverhead, lived on the lake. He saw the adults in there spawning, and he also saw the juveniles in the lake. Um, <clears throat> a, a school of juveniles was captured, oh, I forget now, maybe a decade ago. And about the time they were starting to do survey work on the fish ladder here at Woodhull, I captured some juveniles that had come down over the spillway in the pool below the dam. So yes, they are success. The fish that have been put over the top of the dam have successfully spawned, and the juveniles have been returning for decades now. Okay. Two decades. So, so, so that the, each of these things takes. 10, 15 years, there's nothing easy about it. You're, you're a patient man. Um, this project has taken 10 years, at least 10 years um, from the time we got the rock ramp in. Well, actually it's been 20 years. The rock ramp went in 20 years ago. Um, so so I, it's permits, permits, funding issues, uh, small p political issues, uh, all of the above. Understood. Um, I just I want I I wanted I appreciate your continued stick to itness on this, and uh, you know as we tell the rest of the story, I you know just looks like just a messy construction site, um, but you know the background to this moment is not to be underappreciated. Yeah, the the key aspect here, and this project should have been done by now, but. There were delays in getting materials with you know, um, supply chain issues. Yep. I, I think the important thing here is that we continue this project, get it completed properly and successfully. Uh, the alewife spawning run will start any day now. Uh, they will come into this pool. They may spawn outside of the coffer dam. You can see in the right side picture or they may drop back into the main stem of the river. 
um, you know, if you wanted to be hard nosed about it, you'd tell the construction company, pull the coffer dam and get out of the creek until the alewives are done spawning. That doesn't make logical sense. You know, let's get it done. We're there. We're moving. Yep. Uh, let's keep going. Okay. Byron, Byron, this is Bob Moser. Hi, Bob. Um, hi, how you doing? Um, I was wondering if you would say a little bit about the uh, the eel ladder that's here also. Yes, this is going to be something new. I don't have a good sense of it's going to be okay. I don't have a good sense of the eel ladder. It's going to be on the outside of what you see in the right hand picture. Um, I think it will be basically a tube with some material inside that the the juvenile glass eels can get a purchase on and make it over the dam. Um, I suspect there are eels upstream now, um, but it was be not, it's not easy for them to get over the top of the dam. There's no trickle that they can go up through. Um, but this, will, again, will open up historic access to eels that they haven't been able to get to easily for a century and a half. Wow. <clears throat> All right. I, 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 I'm gonna, I took us down a rabbit hole that was great to be in, but we got to get out. So uh byron thank you and i'm sorry valerie keep at it no worries at all and it's always great to hear from byron so thank you byron you're welcome um so then yesterday we had the uh camera install at grandjable fishway so that was very exciting um very happy that it was yesterday and not today oh yeah. yes <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, granted, I wasn't in the water, but uh, it seemed to all go very smoothly. Um, so looking forward to having that data as well for this year. Where'd you get all those people? They're mostly DEC folks. They turned down. They knew exactly what awesome. they were doing. And Sarah was their fearless leader. So props Great. to Sarah. Beautiful. Wonderful. Um, all right. So then with that, I am going to turn it over to Mike Botini. I believe that I've made you a co-host. So go ahead and screen share if you'd like. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and see if I can uh, get rolling here. The others will stop. OK. Continue. Um, OK. Share and uh, let's see. All right, I'm in. Uh, where am I here? Uh, there we are. Okay, let's see. How's that? Yep. You, you get the good grade for working this. All right, here we go. Go ahead. All right. So, um, yeah, this is just a quick update uh, of this work that I started in 2008, uh, the natural recolonization of Long Island. And uh, here we go. So this uh, just shows the documented areas for the Peconic Estuary watershed that have... Uh, Otter home ranges, um, and what, one thing that's interesting is the the area around Shelter Island. Uh, when I started in two thousand and eight, um, I, I I documented. I'm looking for otter latrines that are maintained, they're visited on a regular basis, and I'm looking for sign at those specific spots. That's a sign that there, there, there's an actual home range that's um, that's being occupied on a regular basis. Otters aren't territorial. And um, as a plug for um, the various conservation groups, uh, the town of Southhold had a really cool preserve that John Sepp, I think he's on on the call here, has done a lot of work in. Um, it's uh, Arshamomic Pond, um, and uh, that was the real hot spot for otters on the East End. Then Mishomic Preserve was the other spot uh, owned by the Nature Conservancy. And then um, uh, 
the alewife brook and scoy pond which was part of the grace estate one of the first preserves a real battle uh, to get that preserved and those were the areas where the otters first had a foothold on the east end of long island so um Kudos to everybody that, that worked on uh, getting those areas preserved. And this is a riparian species. So as long as you have uh, an intact waterway with some food resources, mostly fish, uh, they do eat crab and crayfish as well. And then just a, just a, you know, a good wetland buffer area. Um, that, that's, that's all they really need. And then since 2008, um, They've colonized the um, the whole uh, uh, upper stretch of the Peconic River, so they're they're all the way up into Swan Lake, uh, Calverton area. So that that was more recent. That's in 2018. Okay. Whoops, didn't want to go that far. Okay, yeah. Then. Um, the, um, while we're still uh, monitoring their distribution on, on Long Island, um, and as you could tell in the last slide, there's a lot of areas in the Peconic Estuary that haven't been occupied. There, um, there's still a lot of great habitat there. Uh, but we're, we're also looking at the roadkill situation. So river otters are top of the food chain. Um, and they don't really have any animals that predate on them significantly. So uh, their main source of mortality in a lot of areas is roadkill or trapping where they're allowed to be trapped. Uh, they're not allowed to be trapped on Long Island at this point in time. Um, so roadkills is the big thing and, and, and it's gonna be a big issue for Long Island because it's a very fragmented habitat. So I've marked out the, the roadkill sites. The X's are simple, just where they cross a road from one water body to another water body. Very tricky to mitigate that um, in most cases. The dams, there's a C slash D here. Um, this is Birch Creek. We'll talk about that a little bit on Route 24. Uh, the dams can, um, Sometimes that's kind of a simple ramp will work. And we'll look at one that we tried this summer successfully right here on Little Sea Tuck Creek. And then the sea is a, is a culvert. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So this is the, this is Little Sea Tuck Creek. Um, I found an auto latrine up here in the freshwater pond part of it. And what was happening was uh, they're, they're crossing uh, East Mauritius Boulevard. They, there's a dam under the road and they're forced to, to get out of, the, out of the pond or out of the tidal waters. And they're using a game trail here, which involves crossing the road. Um, so the, the configuration of the dam was pretty simple. It's a big concrete culvert. Uh, we dragged in some, uh, concrete block and built a simple staircase. I never tried this before, but it, I, you know, knowing otters, they're, they're very curious animals. And I figured they, they'd actually love to play around on this. And so I set a, um, a video camera up uh, to document whether or not they would be using it. And sure enough, I got a pair, it's kind of funny the whole sequence. This is a still shot for the PowerPoint, but uh, one of them went down, the other one hesitated. The one that went down came back up, grabbed a hold of the other one and said, let's go, you know, I, obviously there's something going on there. And eventually both of them went down together. So kind of cool. Um, this is the Route 24 roadkill site in Flanders um, near Hubbard, Hubbard Creek County Park. So they're crossing from the tidal waters on the north side into Birch Creek Pond. And this is a little bit tricky because the, the dam, and this is very common on the south shore of Long Island. It's this small uh, concrete box. The one on the left is actually a photograph from Forge River. 
uh, goes under uh, Montauk Highway. And it's, it's very tight, very constrained, tough to put a ramp in. And on the, um, on the right here is the actual configuration of the box and the spillway uh, that goes under Route 24. What the other issue here is that it goes into a um, culvert that goes under the road and I couldn't find the far end of the culvert. The Nature Conservancy did this huge project where they mapped and measured all of the road stream crossings in Suffolk County. It just so happens that Birch, this Birch Creek site was not, um, they didn't really complete the assessment. And I talked to uh, Nicole Marr and she recalls that the, uh, it, it appears that the concrete, cult, the uh, it probably, I don't know if it's concrete or steel, but it's crushed at the north end. So they couldn't find the, that end of it. What's, what's great about this project, it does need a little bit of work. We got to fill in some of the gaps here, but we now have a blueprint uh, that we can hand off to any infrastructure projects that the DOT is doing, including the town highway departments, because we can do an ecological assessment as well as a um, sea level rise assessment for the sizing of these culverts. And we can make recommendations to help wildlife. Um, so, so that's pretty cool. Um, this is another, uh, this is, a real surprise. This is uh, Cedar Point County Park. And an otter was hit leaving Alewife Pond and heading into this tiny uh, 5,000 square foot button bush swamp where it was probably feeding on frogs. There's real, I don't think there's any fish in there. But the culvert under the road here is, is not suitable for them to go through it. Um, so that's, um, I, I, and I don't know that it's such a quiet road. It's a, it's, it's a million and one shot that it got hit, but it did get hit and killed. And the interesting thing about otters is that, um, they will use these culverts if they're provided. This is probably 10 inches in diameter. And then otter came through. This is Stoddinger's pond. I mean, it would just be just as easy for them to to get out of the pond and, and cross over the, the earthen berm there. There's no road on the top, <clears throat> but being curious and playful animals, um, they thought, oh, and it's just a piece of plastic, corrugated plastic, it's not a fancy um, culvert. So if we can get away with culverts um, in some of these spots, I think they will use them. The other um, more common roadkill sites are uh, just road crossings. So this is, we were just talking about the Little River. So this is just uh, south of the dam project where they're putting in the fish ladder um, that Byron was talking about. And they're crossing over from Little River into Cheney Pond. Um, and uh, the, the topography here it would be challenging to put in a culvert, not impossible because there is a, like a ditch in between the two road beds, the, the north and the southbound lanes, but it would be a little bit tricky. Um, and there's a lot of these situations that would be tough. Um, this one um, is a very unfortunate situation that um, I think as a group, you know, we need to keep our eyes open for, for this kind of stuff. So this is a roadkill on Route 58 in Riverhead where they've got all of these um, shopping, you know, malls and car dealerships. It's right across from the Ford dealership and the, the Lowe's. And, and, and it was crossing into a beautiful uh, Tupelo swamp right here and then going up into these little ponds off of Osborne Lane. Um, the, so the Agway is right here. And one of the things that I've noticed in doing this study over the years is the otters will utilize every little tiny uh, 
freshwater wetland in the watershed. It's amazing. Um, six, uh, six latrine sites right in these little tiny ponds. I mean, you would drive by, you wouldn't even know there were the ponds were there. Uh, but the, <clears throat> the interesting thing about this is this is the Tupelo swamp. Really high quality, no invasive species in here. And um, Drew Associates was hired, our buddy Ron Abrams, uh, to, to put in yet another shoehorn, another uh, little mini mall. And he convinced the DEC that this was really not a wetland. It's, it's, this was on the freshwater wetlands map and he got the DEC to sign off, take this off the freshwater wetland map. This is a huge problem because uh, there's a lot of these spots. And, and I mean, this is really high quality. So there's no wetland buffer. And this is the area they cleared. So they completely, here's the wetland that I took the photos of. And this is all cleared out. This is their access road. And now they've completely broken the um, Greenbelt Corridor for uh, wildlife to, to utilize these wetlands that were part of a river otter's home range. So the, the only options we have really now, um, I was promised by the planners in Riverhead that they were not going to nuke this wetland. But there's, so we, we, and this is owned by the town highway depot department. And um, we could reconstruct a, a wildlife corridor to connect to this area where there's a public well, and then this connects over to these wetlands. And on the other side of the road, um, this is a tributary of the, here's the Peconic River down here. And there's a tributary that goes under uh, West Main Street, under the railroad tracks. There's a huge piece of vacant land here. Um, John Turner did some botanizing here, found some really cool rare plants. This is all Town Park, Riverhead Town Park. And there's, this is a town office building right here. So this stream flows up into a pond freshwater pond right behind um, Lowe's. And um, if we can stitch together a green belt, uh, we can work with the town and, um, and connect in with this park. And the topography of, of um, Old Country Road here is such that uh, it's sunk down on both sides of the road. So you, we could slide, there's ways that you can vibrate a, uh, a steel culvert in under the road, as long as there's no uh, buried utilities and stuff, but it's a possibility that I think we should explore. Hey, hey Mike, as you're going yeah. through this, uh, just think about the, uh, there's gonna be a bond deck on the bow this November and and you know, having a package of a river otter, you know, restoration and protection strategy encompassing some of these suggestions, okay, as a as a package in the geography of Riverhead, I think would be a really right. nice project to consider. Now, Kevin, is that is that bond act for the state or yep. the county? It's going to be state. a state bond act. Okay. It's going to be four billion dollars. It's going to have environmental restoration, climate mitigation, and other things. All this strikes me as a project eligible, so. Yeah, and the other thing that's happening here, and, and I've, I've talked to Joyce and, and the Environmental Committee in Riverhead, so they're, they're um, looking at the whole Route 48 corridor uh, yeah. in terms of updating their master plan. It's gotten stalled with COVID, but um, yeah. they're really interested in not making the same mistake. So here's the mini mall that went in, our favorite little store, Hobby Lobby, got the lease. And, and this is the remnant wetland left over here. Um, Mike, do okay, you so then, then this is the bigger picture for Riverhead. So all of these tributaries of the Peconic River come right up to uh, Route 58. 
Hey, Mike, do you mind answering just two questions that have popped yeah. up? Yeah. Um, okay, so Mark, I saw your hand was up. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, please, Mike. Uh, you and I had worked on this. Uh, we were going to rename it Batini Creek, actually. Um, and we'd like to be roped back into that. We started up again uh, live with the Environmental Advisory Committee in Town of Riverhead. Uh, Frank Bayrod is now our liaison. And uh, it was on my agenda to talk about this last night. So whatever you're doing, please rope us back into that. And we are also impacting the uh, comprehensive plan at the same time. So let's make sure that it's all on the docket for each of those three things. Okay, thank you, Mark. Will do. Um, we have one. There was another question? Yes, uh, in the chat, we have one question from Jane. Um, so the roadkill on Route 58, um, where there's all of that development, it seems to have only fresh water around. Is, where is the nearest saltwater body? Uh, the nearest saltwater body is um, in downtown Riverhead. Th these are all tributaries of the Pecan River. Uh, How's Mike doing on time? Uh, Mike is doing well. There's um, about five more minutes allotted to him, but... Okay, that's good. Thank all you. right, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so the, and you can see some of the, this area here, uh, John Turner did a report on the uh, Atlantic white cedar grove in here. There's, there's a lot of great habitat left in here that needs to be protected. By the way, Terry Creek, the Peconic Land Trust just bought that 100 acre property on the um, just downstream of what I'm showing here. And uh, the river otters are using that property. It's part of a home range of, of at least one river otter. Julie Wesnowski is on the agenda to cool. tell that story, Mike, that you just stole. So yeah, yeah, great. That's so why you're, um, that's finishing why you're up, uh, <laughs> this is a publication that I, I just got back from the printer's office earlier this uh, month. And uh, this is available on the CTUC website for downloading. It's, it's 30 pages and it's, um, it's basically, it discusses uh, what an otter latrine is, uh, where to find them, um, distinguishing otter sign from other things that are easily confused with otter sign like raccoon tracks. And um, believe it or not, snapping turtle tracks have been uh, confused with otter. This on, on, on the left here, that's snapping turtles coming out of Quogue Wildlife Refuge and uh, muskrat tracks. Uh, I think the tail drag is what really throws people off. So a lot of information and um, I think that's, that's it. Um, so I put about a hundred people through the, um, the river otter survey workshops over the years. I've got three more scheduled for March. And um, this is just something that'll help people out um, if they're interested in getting involved with monitoring. And one last thing is the, the um, I'm working with Matt Schlesinger, who a lot of you know is the New York State zoologist. And we're gonna launch a Long Island mammal survey this year, which will have a big citizen science component in terms of getting people out with remote camera traps and recording the distribution of various species on Long Island. Some of the species we're most interested in, gray fox, uh, striped skunk, long-tail weasel, and mink. Those are species that we really have no information about. And ironically, the DEC allows uh, trapping for all those species. Um, and uh, hopefully we can use the data uh, that we collect to make a change in those regulations. That's really unprofessional, to be honest, to the, 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 the trapping regulations is supposed to reflect the state of the resource and uh, they can't justify that for Long Island. So thanks everybody. Thanks Mike. Uh, do we have time for questions Valerie or? We have one minute. Okay. <laughs> Valerie, Valerie's, Valerie's tough. Um, Mike, that was great. Thank you. Um, if anybody wants to work with Mike on the 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 sort of uh, 
corridor preservation uh, sort of thing that he generated, that'd be great. Mike, if you don't mind, if you would give us some of your slides or send something to Valerie, we don't sure. want to steal your, steal your work, but we'd also maybe let everybody else just have it again. Um, and maybe they'll get inspired to work on some sort of a plan. I mean, the, the big takeaway, quite obviously, is in a place that looks like it is wholly inhospitable to any legitimate natural uh, uh, habitat for wildlife survival, County Route 58, in spite of every insult thrown at it, uh, there's still a couple of interesting uh, opportunities there. Maybe we can do better. Yeah, absolutely. Those those three um, tributaries that that you know basically are counting on the town of Riverhead to protect are have a lot of good riparian habitat that hasn't been developed. And uh, yeah, definitely need to work on that. Okay, very good, Mike. Thank okay. You. So I'll be so in much. touch, Valerie. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have another question in the chat that actually leads nicely into our next presenter. Um, how does the Peconic Land Trust interface with PEP for land protection? Um, we do have um, a slew of projects that we've worked on together, but we are going to hear about one project, um, specifically a Peconic Land Trust project, um, Broad Cove. So Lee, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen and talk a little bit about that. Okay, I will give this a try. Okay, did that work? It did. Yay! <laughs> All right. Um, so for anyone who might not be familiar with the Land Trust, we've been around since 1983. Um, we work actively to preserve land um, with public partners and privately. We steward about 200 properties we own, um, sponsor lots of educational programs and do some public policy work as well. So this is Broad Cove. Um, we believe it was the largest privately held undeveloped parcel on the estuary. It was a former duck farm and is around 100 acres in Aquabog. Um, it's been a very high priority for preservationists for decades, probably close to 40 years. So to put it in context, uh, the Broad Cove parcel is the one in yellow. Um, I know Meeting House Creek was mentioned earlier. That's right here. Terry's Creek came up before. That's right here. There's a lot of shoreline. This is actually what is known as Broad Cove and then right into the Peconic Bay. Um, so you can see that it really completes this huge swath of protected land here, most significantly um, being Indian Island County Park, which is right across the water from. And as well, you know, there, there have been um, some other sizable properties in the area that have been preserved. There's some farmland across the street. Most of these are preserved farmland parcels as well. So we started working with the DEC in 2019 on this project and um, had made some really good progress, but then COVID, so like everything else in the world, it got derailed. Um, and especially on the state level, you know, nothing was going to happen. So we just tried to keep the conversation and the relationship going with the, with the um, landowners. But the property was being actively marketed and has been over the years, um, almost continuously. So this was a lovely brochure put out by, by Corcoran. Um, and the focus was on marketing this property for a resort. So it's own tourism resort campus, um, which very few properties in the town of Riverhead have that designation, especially one of this size. 
So this is a, a rendering that Corcoran had done of what a potential resort would look like. Um, and it's not that far off because during this time, an, a special permit application had been submitted to the town of Riverhead, which pretty much mirrored what we're looking at here. So you can see um, big hotel, spa, equestrian center, um, you know, shops, restaurant, bar, like pretty much maxing out the property as, as a resort. Um, and they were successful. Um, at the end of 2020, we found out that the owners had accepted an offer from a developer um, who was looking to develop it into a resort and that contracts had actually been sent out. So um, we were in a bit of a pickle at that point, but fortunately, uh, the landowner was willing to entertain an offer from the land trust as long as we made it yesterday. Um, so we worked as hard as we could to come up with something um, that the landowner would agree to, and it had to be done pretty quickly. You know, bringing the DEC in was, was not going to be able to happen at this juncture. We were going to have to go out on our own. So um, we made an offer of 11 and a half million that the landowner accepted. And what we did was secure six private lines of credit totaling 12 million. So to cover the 11 and a half million purchase price plus the carrying cost, we knew we were gonna you know, incur along the way. The idea here is that um, those donors who offered up those line of credits will be paid back when we hopefully transfer the property to the DEC. Um, they are definitely still very interested in the property, but that's going to take quite a few years to happen. So one of the issues that that had always derailed um, other preservation deals in the past surrounded the, the property's former use as a duck farm. So uh, this is an aerial from 1962 when it was really in its heyday. And you can see pretty much every inch of the properties used. They were growing crops, a um, lot of structures all over the place. These are the Doug Lagoons, um, you know, numerous other structures here. And the question always came up, well, who is gonna be responsible and who's gonna pay for the cleanup of this property and any possible remediation that um, may, might be needed. So as a condition of closing, the landowner did agree to undertake that process um, and ended up having to demolish and remove about 22 structures that were still left on site. Um, they were in varying states of disrepair. Um, here are some of the highlights. Some of them were wood, some of them were concrete. They included the actual duck houses, barns, a machine shop, um, some like worker housing, a whole like processing center. So there was a lot going on there and it took quite a few months um, to get that all cleaned up. But eventually it was, and this is, um, actually I can just flip back. What I'm showing you is the cleanup of this area, which was very involved. This was one of the larger structures on the property. It was all concrete and that's where they processed the ducks for sale. Um, and you had to go across this little bridge here, this island, to get to it. So it was a really involved effort. Um, but you can see some of the brush left over from clearing that out. And we're all very much looking forward to the springtime when um, some of the ground cover that was planted will start to come up and fill in. 
So after that, we finally closed on December 31st. And this is myself and Andreas Weiss, uh, the former owner of the property, all happy and smiling because um, we brought this to fruition and it really worked out very well. He's very excited, you know, that, that we could make this happen. Um, and the question we kind of get from here on out is, well, what are you going to do with the property? So for now, we're just holding it um, until the DEC hopefully can come in. We're not really, we don't really have the capacity to open it up to the public, um, but we do plan on having some, um, some of our educational programs. There are some hikes, some cleanups, that sort of thing to get some people out onto the property so that they can start to enjoy it. The DEC, um, this was sort of a two-pronged acquisition for them, obviously very important for you know, water quality, habitat protection, but they also um, envision a, a passive recreational use, you know, so hikes and kayaking and that sort of thing. So does anyone have any questions? So, so Julie, um... Uh, Kevin here. Uh, congratulations. Uh, the only thing that seemed more impossible than, than this acquisition was Brian's, uh, Byron's story on the impossibility of getting fish passages completed. Um, you know, I, I, the Nature Conservancy had some involvement in this in probably 10, 15 years ago. This, this probably has been a 30 year effort. And congratulations to you and the Land Trust for your success in pulling this off. It's terrific. Um, and Valerie and, uh, and Jade, if you guys could think of, is there an opportunity where, uh, this is a high profile, high exposed uh, uh, part of the, of, the, of the river and access to the river. And I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity for a partnership for the restoration of the site and the manner in which uh, the public's enjoyment of it respects the natural setting, but also makes it an enjoyable experience. And, you know, doing the site restoration is always tough and nobody ever has, has money for that. But I'm just wondering if that's something that ought to be the subject of a long, longer conversation. But terrific work, great for you guys, really wonderful deal. And, um, you know, the pictures, of course, sell the whole thing. So thanks again. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And yeah, we couldn't have done it without all the groundwork that had been laid for years and well, years and years on this. Uh, you, you guys, you guys pulled the deal off. So you get all the credit. I was just making all I was doing was making the point that it had been around forever. And um, and I, I would just uh is, are there any other questions about the site for Julie? And, uh, and, and if so, or if not, uh, we'll move on. But I want to be sure if there are any. It's a terrific deal, really wonderful. I have another question. Yeah. Um, Julie, I, I know that the state is the ultimate destination, which I think is great because that uh, you know opens it up to kind of the greatest number of potential visitors, which I always think is important. Do you know what funding source the state tends to tap, or does that still need to be worked out, or what what, what their plans are? Um, yeah, I can't offer you much information on that at this moment. Well, I, 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 I'll take a stab at it. I mean, you know, this this. There's a there's a line in the Environment and Protection Fund every year uh, that is used for open space acquisition, you know, watershed protection, things like that. So I'm assuming this is that category, and and uh, you know it's a pretty reliable funding source. So you know, don't let them string you along too long, Julie, before you <laughs> get to close the deal. Yeah. Yes, we are hoping it. I mean, yes, they they are very interested. They've committed as much as they can at this point in time, and we're all just hoping. Yes, it's a matter of time, not an if, just a when. Right. And, and Augie, where were you going with the question? You're just wondering how. Oh, they, how whenever I talk to the state, they say they have no money. So you know, like that's where I'm well, going. If that's the case, Augie, we're coming back to you. <laughs> Well, I mean, they may say they have no money for the, you know, this is not the first time this has happened. They they don't have money for priorities that may not be as high as as this one. And clearly, they like this piece. Clearly, they like 
probably the duck hunting opportunities also that are there. And, uh, you know, it's okay. They Listen, they're doing a deal. They wanted to do the deal. They want to do the deal. We should all just clap, right? Well said. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? Questions, thoughts, observations, other than our eternal thanks to to uh, Julie Wasnowski and the Pecanic Land Trust. Thank you, guys. You're very welcome. Thanks so much. And uh, Julia, I'll turn it over to you if you're ready. All righty, let me get it ready in a moment. Okay. Up so I can see it better. All right, here's the question of the day. Do you see a full screen or do you see the wrong side? <laughs> it's not the full, Julie. Not we the have full the next screen. slide. Okay, I'll do a, uh, swap it out. I feel like this is not even. Thank you. Better? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for inviting me to the CAC meeting. I am Julia Priolo. I'm uh, from the Suffolk County Department of Health Services. And I'm just gonna do a quick update for everybody on the county's Reclaim Our Water initiative, which includes the uh, grant program to fund uh, the installation of nitrogen removing sanitary systems and the approval and management of those uh, nitrogen removing sanitary systems. We also refer to them as innovative alternative on-site wastewater treatment systems or IAs. It's a little bit easier to say IAs, but sometimes the amount of acronyms that I have in my slideshows can be a little dizzying. So uh, feel free to let me know if you have questions um, or any uh, if you need some clarification. Right. So what are our grant programs that are administered here in Suffolk County? We have two. We have the Suffolk County Septic Improvement Program, referred to as SIP, S-I-P. And we also administer a grant that comes from New York State, the New York State Septic System Replacement Program, SSRP. The Suffolk County SIP grant is $10,000. That's the base amount. And then there are additional grant funds available as needed, the additional $5,000 for um, property owners that require the use of a pressurized shallow drain field leaching system rather than gravity fed um, leaching rings. The purpose of this is for sites that are can be really difficult, like let's say they live really close to the shoreline and they have really high groundwater and you can't put in a leaching, um, a nor a, a, regular leaching ring because groundwater is so high and you have to be uh, elevated above groundwater. Um, we have some technologies available called pressurized shallow drain fields that allow uh, a system to be installed really shallow in the, in the ground and don't require the use of a very large retaining wall and uh, as much fill that would be needed. Um, but sometimes they can be more costly. And so we um, add additional uh, funds for those types of lots. We also have additional funding for the installation of these IAs if the homeowner qualifies as low to moderate income. That's what I have here as LMI eligible applicants. And so that LMI eligibility is based on federal HUD guidelines for Suffolk and Nassau counties. And um, they, they just have a straight additional $5,000 for those people to cover uh, additional costs of the installation of the IA. We also have a pilot program under SIP where we have additional funding to cover the cost of design services from, for example, an engineer or an architect to design the sanitary system for um, LMI eligible applicants. Um, but this, I wrote potential here 
because this is not available for everyone, it's a very limited amount of money we have for that. Moving on to the second grant is the New York State Septic System Replacement Program. That is an additional grant of up to $10,000. So most applicants, when they apply to our program, apply to both of these grants and can get, therefore, usually $20,000 up to $30,000 towards the cost of their new sanitary system to replace their existing cesspool or septic tank uh, that do not do anything to remove nitrogen from the wastewater before it's released into the environment. We also do partner with CDCLI to offer additional um, low interest loans if applicants need it. And then um, this pertains to this group in the Beconic Estuary region. There are towns, uh, the towns of Southampton, East Hampton, and Shelter Island have additional funding through their CPF to cover uh, the cost of IA installations. All of this grant funding enables Suffolk County to implement sanitary system upgrades in accordance with the timeline and the uh, protocols and guidelines in the sub watersheds wastewater plan, which was completed by Suffolk County and our consultant in 2019, which lays out how what what's our problem, how do we fix it and how and this is how how you should fix it in this amount of time and this much money in order to get it done in order to reach our nitrogen reduction goals to um, and either protect water quality as it is, or start to restore water quality in areas that are have already seen many impairments. Julia, just so people know, if you if you recall, uh, like the load reductions that the county needs to see are, you know, anywhere between 40, 50, and and in some cases 90 percent, right? So, can you just give people that context? So oh, yes, the sub watersheds wastewater plan looked at 191 different water bodies here in Suffolk County. We divided it into different harbors and um, estuaries, and we looked at the land uses of the areas that contribute groundwater to and surface water um, into those areas. How much nitrogen is going in from what type of land uses? What is the water mixing in that water body? Is is it is the residence time in that water body very short or is it very long? And what are the impairments that we're currently seeing in that water body? And we added all those together and um, determined how much we need to remove nitrogen from entering into this water body in order to achieve what was considered um, ideal water quality. And um, we have a range, um, but most of the water bodies in Suffolk County have uh, load reduction goals in the upper range, uh, 50, 60, 70, 90 percent reduction of nitrogen needs to happen in these areas in order to achieve ideal water quality. Any amount of reduction is obviously going to get us closer to that. Um, but this is these are serious goals and um, they're not going to be achieved overnight. It took uh, decades to get to this point of development and releasing wastewater that's untreated into our environment. And so, um, we were able to break it up into 191 water bodies. Each has a, a goal associated with it, and we're moving towards achieving those goals step by step. Currently, with our um, implementation and approval and new mandates to install IAs, as well as the grant funding that's available to incentivize the use of IA systems. Uh, moving forward, uh, the county does have plans to expand. Um, the grant program and the management of IAs, mandates of IAs through a countywide wastewater management district, and which will enable installation of IAs on a larger scale managed by Suffolk County. More to um, uh, be learned about the proposed uh, countywide wastewater management district over the next few months, as um, is going to be proposed on the ballots this November that we um, establish a countywide wastewater management district here in Suffolk County in order to yeah. enable we, wastewater upgrades on a countywide scale. That's, that's a strong potential, but it hasn't been settled. And, and Julia, just for your benefit, I'm sorry, for the, um, the benefit of others, you would just, the program description 
is actually tied into an extremely rigorous and justified reduction strategy. It's not like we have a program because it wasn't a problem. We have a program because it's a serious problem. I just wanted to be sure that connection. Yes. Made. I'm sorry I interrupted. Carry on, please. Yes. Yeah, there are some names I recognize on this group, but I'm not aware of, every, of everybody in the audience and how um, involved um, everybody is or um, on the nitrogen loading problem here, that we have here in Suffolk County. I, I hear you. And uh, this is one of the ways that we're looking to solve that uh, known problem. So I just wanted to give a little bit more background on our grant programs. They, the Suffolk County um, grant, the SIP program, Septic Improvement Program was launched in 2017. Uh, where Suffolk County Legislature determined we would allocate $2 million to this program per year for five years for a total of $10 million. And uh, the state learned about our program and has the same goals as Suffolk County does to remove nitrogen and reduce the amount of nitrogen entering the environment. They um, made aware. They were made aware of our program, and they added on to our program in 2018. Suffolk County was awarded an initial 10 million dollars from New York State to establish this secondary uh, grant program here. By 2020, all of that funding was used up because of the extreme popularity and need for these grants. And so, um, between COVID, as we've been discussing today, the pandemic, the stay at home um, order, we saw so many failures of these block test schools that um, were, have been in place for 50 years. We're not used to having people live there year round, 24 hours a day, five people living there and never leaving. We saw so many failures of sanitary systems that um, our grant funding just you know, went out the window. So many IAs were being replaced, um, so many cesspools were being replaced with IAs. And um, the program was essentially just going on a fast track. And so we fully allocated all the grant funds by 2020, but Suffolk County legislators um, recognized this as a, as a problem and decided to allocate additional funding towards the septic improvement program, $3.7 million in order to keep it going. That was also quickly utilized um, in 2020, uh, but by uh, mid May 2021, uh, funding was restored and replenished to these programs. $10 million in um, county funding was allocated to the septic improvement program, and um, Suffolk County was awarded an additional $10.025 million from New York State to continue this SSRP program. So that was uh, in last year. So to date, Suffolk County has invest, invested $21.7 million into the septic improvement program grant funding. And as of this month, the current funding that we have should enable the issuance of additional 300 uh, grants for these IA systems, which will likely bring us to June 2022. And so we're in the process of uh, requesting additional funding be allocated to the SIP program from the Suffolk County Legislature. And also to date, New York State has invested over $20 million in uh, Suffolk County's SSRP grant funds. Currently, um, the New York State SSRP funds we have are the second award of a five-year appropriation cycle that was established under go previous Governor uh, Cuomo. And the current funds, the remaining SSRP funds we have right now will likely be fully allocated to property owners by August of 2022. And so an official request for a third award from New York State uh, is going to be requested soon. Essentially, uh, the program is needed. It's very popular and we wanna keep it rolling at the pace that we've been able to uh, keep up with. Julie, there's a question here uh, uh, from uh, Patrice Dalton. Uh, is the program currently funded now and is it only being funded for failed septic systems, uh, which appears to have been the case last year, according to the question. So the program is currently funded. There, um, we issue between 15 and 20 county grants and 15 and 20 state grants each week to property owners that are um, have applied and uh, are in the queue. We do have a scoring system, which I will just, I have a um, more description on a few slides from now that will be, make it a little bit easier for me to, for, 
for you to understand what I'm trying to describe. Uh, but yes, we're currently funded right now. And um, there, during this time period of, on this previous slide, of no, al no grant funds available that you're referencing uh, between mid-2020 to mid-2021, uh, we couldn't issue more grants because we didn't have the funding to back it up. Yep. However, we did continue to accept applications. So what does that result in? A, 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 a queue of people waiting to get a grant. And if, and folks, so will if fo folks will remember, there was so much uncertainty at the municipal and governmental level. People weren't sure whether they, with COVID, could, could, could make the grants, how were things working. There were all kinds of construction problems associated with, with this, and in some cases, supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. so, so it was a pretty struggle moment. But the answer to the question generally is if people are interested, they should apply and they should go through the process. And I hope you have the link at the end of the slideshow. Yes. yes, people should definitely apply to our program. Here are some quick stats um, as of this past month. The program has uh, been in place for a little, um, a little over four and a half years. We have received to date over 3,000 applications for, for the county property owners. And to date, we have issued 1,669 county SIP grants and um, 1,000, oops, I have an extra digit here, 1,600, I believe it's either, I think, I don't think I need that six on there, 1,000. Uh, 614 New York State grants. Usually those grants are paired together to the same property owner. Sometimes based on eligibility, they're not always paired, but usually they are and they receive uh, both grant amounts. Uh, we have um, just about 1,000 grant funded IAs installed and paid out to their contractors. We pay the grants directly to the installer so the home homeowner doesn't have that out of pocket cost. And um, that amount of uh, grants um, IAs installed equates to the amount of funds paid out that you should see on this uh, slide, uh, $9.6 million of county funds and almost $9 million of state funds paid out to date for those completed projects. So um, this in 2021, we had revised our SIP rules and regulations for several reasons. One of the revisions was to prioritize grant issuance for public health and safety concerns. This, we needed to modify the grant application scoring and add definitions of catastrophic and non-catastrophic failure. During the time of full grant funds allocation, we had people um, applying that had failing systems, a like collapsed cesspool in their front yard, major public health and safety concern. And the way that our uh, scoring was in place based on our SIP rules and regulations at that time, uh, some people had to wait for people with higher scores than them in order before we can issue those catastrophic failures uh, grant. And so that was not a situation we wanted to get involved in. We want those people to upgrade to an IA. We want to fund that with our grant programs. And so we needed to change our rules and regulations in order for us to do that. And um, You'll see here at the bottom of the screen, the scoring for our grants. Um, score of 100 means they, a person has a catastrophic failure, um, regardless of where it's located in Suffolk County. It's still a catastrophic failure and it needs to be addressed immediately. Second in line is a property with a non-catastrophic failure, regardless of where that's located. This is uh, systems that are failing but don't need to be addressed immediately. Let's say you're getting pumped multiple times a year and it's on its way out, it's starting to back up, uh, but you can temporarily fix it over time with either pumping or service. Uh, if you have a block cesspool, that is something that will eventually fail. We know that and we wanna get rid of block cesspools. These are at least 50, 60, 70 years old now. And so, uh, this is the new scoring as you see here. And then a score of 80 is you have no failure, uh, but you want to upgrade or you need to upgrade and you're in a priority area one based on a, a map that I'll have on the next slide. And then continues on from there, priority area to non-priority area. And so when Jane was mentioning, we only issue grants to people with failures. 
it's not that we only do, it's we follow the scoring. And since uh, we had that queue, that, that wait list um, accrue during the time of uh, lack of funding, uh, we had to address people with the higher scores first, essentially. But once those are all addressed, we are able to move on to people with no failures. So continue to apply. The second um, change that we did make to our rules and regulations was to upgrade the priority area maps based on the subwatersheds wastewater plan. And we added in um, drinking water protection. Previously, the map was just based on surface water protection. However, we wanted to add in drinking water protection for areas that, um, like for example, Shelter Island and the North Fork and the South Fork, where they may not be as close to the shoreline, but the water quality underneath those properties is very important for drinking water because a lot of those people rely on uh, private wells. And so these revised rules and regulations are intended to expedite grant issuance for homeowners with failed sanitary systems and to establish priority areas for the protection of drinking water. These revisions um, are currently in effect since fall of 2021, and the website is currently um, under revision to reflect that, the um, online application. Here is the map, the new updated priority area map. Any um, area that's shown in a color other than tan is a type of priority area. I wanted to point out that the areas shown in red, for example, here on Shelter Island, the center of Shelter Island, a lot of um, those areas in town of Southfold, uh, Hampton Bays area, some areas in uh, East Hampton, Southampton, those previously, uh, a lot of that area previously wasn't a priority area at all. And they wouldn't, they would get a very low score if they're not near the shoreline. And so we were able to bump up those areas uh, to protect drinking water. Um, so essentially shown here, areas in uh, color will receive a, a higher score you know, as a priority area. And just to reiterate, um, grant funding since the funding was replenished or reestablished in May of 2021, when funding was reestablished, since then we've been able to issue uh, approximately, by now 500 grants, sorry, I didn't update this number since last week. Um, and have, they have been awarded to applicants with failing sanitary systems because those are the people with the highest scores. And since October of 2021, since our um, rules and regulations were updated to reflect that catastrophic failure change, we've had 46 applicants with these catastrophic failures that were able to get grants immediately and not have to wait for someone else ahead of them. So that's uh, purely the date of application based. And as of this month, the wait list for applicants with non-catastrophic failing systems has been decreased from four months, which it was back in May, down to two weeks. And so essentially um, people apply, we're able to get them grants very shortly after that. And now that um, the wait list for non-catastrophic failures is essentially almost at zero, we are now able to start issuing grants to people with uh, lower scores um, without any indication of failure. And so grants have continued to be issued. If you have, if there's more questions on that, um, we can continue on uh, after the, after a few more slides. And so I just wanted to mention that we do keep track of the IAs that are installed on with this grant funding since the beginning of our uh, program back in 2017. And I wanted to highlight that huge increase of installations, these blue bars during the pandemic stay at home period we saw a really huge increase in these installations. And we do continue to see them go up. Uh, the lack of funding, lack of grant issuance did attribute to a lower amount of um, installs, uh, but we do see it to go up again. We also still have that uh, taxability issue that uh, we've been talking about for several years now, where um, the grant funds are being considered taxable and these property owners are receiving 1099s. They just received another batch of them from Suffolk County Comptroller this past January, February. And that is still something we are looking to reverse and resolve, uh, but haven't um, achieved a ruling, a new ruling from IRS yet, or uh, haven't received word from uh, Washington, D.C. yet on that new ruling. Mm -hmm. So that folks know there, there was a, a bill in the Build Back Better bill that did not pass Congress, as most of you know, the corrected language was in that bill. 
And the failure of that bill to pass uh, actually killed the effort to address this issue. It mm -hmm. was an extraordinary effort uh, that had been undertaken by uh, a lot of people. And uh, it was a national effort with others. And we have nothing to show for it other than our frustration. Yes. Let me take a look at some of the questions in the chat. Um, I have a question. Um, it's not in the chat. Okay. May I ask it? Um, I'm, I'm on the board of the Akabonic Protection Committee. And we, where we live around Akabonic Harbor, the area that the watershed, the, the travel time of the water can be like five years or less you know, from, from where we are. So we're, we've kind of made it an objective um, to have people install these IA systems, even though they're not failed systems. We, just as a policy, could you please consider doing this? Mm -hmm. And the fact, you know, the, the lack of um, the funding for the non-failed systems has been a bit of a barrier, but I'm very happy to hear what you just said about working through the failed systems. Um, we have, Akabonic Harbor has very high nitrogen. It's an impaired water body because of the nitrogen levels and it's getting higher, as you noted, um, there's more people here all the time. Yeah. So thank you for your presentation. Um, it was really, really helpful. Yes. Yeah. Thank, I do have you. some more slides on IAs. I just want to um, go over any more questions on the grant program, but so thank you. How are we doing on time, Valerie? You good? Um, and I can uh, send out a, the slides or share the slides with Valerie to send out to everyone to take a look. We do have on our website um, the priority area map to zoom in on and look at. And um, so we are I, running I, a bit late. Um, Julia, do you mind um, it take, just taking like one minute to wrap up? Is that okay, yeah. Yeah, I don't have too much more. Um, IAs on general, general uh, performance here in Suffolk County, we regulate and manage the use of these IAs. There are different technologies that can be used based on how well they actually remove nitrogen. And we do have big news to share that there are two IA technologies that have graduated to our final approval tier called general use approval. That's the Hydro Action IA system and the Fuji Clean IA system. Um, and there still are others that can be used, but those are two that um, have been in place long enough and proven their performance long enough to uh, enter the general use approval phase. And the other technologies that are also can be used um, and paired with the grant funding are shown here on this slide. We continue to monitor their performance and if um, and when they achieve the standard, they can be moved into general use approval or their uh, approval be, will be revoked and no longer be able to get used here in Suffolk County. And there are other technologies, for example, New York State Center for Clean Water Technology at Stony Brook University has technologies that can be used here in Suffolk County and they are going through that same approval phase. Um, for example, the uh, nitrogen re reducing biofilters, NRBs. And I just wanted, I just had some pictures of IAs that were installed um, at, from some of our septic improvement programs sites. These are hydro actions that were installed at some sites and a uh, Fuji clean system shown here. At the end, you see lids at the end so that we have access to um, maintain them and sample them and um, re you know, replace anything that needs to be replaced. So it is a little bit different than what we're used to seeing. This is a septi tech system with a pressurized shallow drain field, that um, structure that can receive additional funding. After it's installed, it's a, uh, you know, not, you can't even see it's there. And then also just wanted to mention that there are electrical components of these systems, air uh, pumps, air intake, and electrical boxes that are installed at the site. So please visit our website, reclaimourwater.info. Please email me, contact me uh, with more questions and concerns and comments. Thank you. Julia, thank, thank you, so you. Much. Very thorough. Uh, if we have any questions for Julia, please, uh, have a free for all. Yeah, I have a question there. Um, so I live in an area in the Akabonic watershed 
it, it's uh, small lots. Um, well, the, one of the problems I see with this program is uh, the, the old grandfather clause that Suffolk County Department of Health Services has honored since I started working at the group, which is, you know, you're, you're good to go. If you have a, a septic system that's sitting in the water table, uh, you're not required to upgrade it unless you come in with uh, some kind of major uh, house remodeling project. And, um, you know, we're all on wells and the nitrogen's going to die. I mean, it, you know, it, it, there, are, there are a lot of places that, that, that are, there's a lots of so small, it would be more bang for the buck to put in small sewage treatment plants. Mm -hmm. So is that part of the, I mean, let's face it, uh, you know, by the, time, by the time everybody who's got failing septic systems or poorly designed septic systems gets the AI system, uh, sea level rise might have wiped out the South Fork. I mean, what are we talking? We're talking about two thousand systems that have been approved. Well, so I mean, you know, it's a drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. So, so in Mike, five what, years, but we're we're exponentially moving, I'd say, and we are looking at sewage treatment plants where they are feasible and can be done in a timely manner. You know, here we are, how many years after Hurricane Sandy, and the 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 shoveler was just put in the Forge River sewer treatment plant um, sewering project, but that's happening. And so that's a huge, you know, it's outside of PEP, but that's a large area of small lots that are going to go on sewers in the Mass Dick Shirley area. So in the meantime, you know, this many IAs have been put in. And so it's, it's there's no one answer for everywhere. And so we have many um, different plans to get our nitrogen reduction goals in place. And some of it definitely includes um, sewers, some of it includes IAs, clustering a neighborhood. That is a great idea that is new and is looking to come to fruition as we move through. You know, we can't, we don't have easy, easy the, the low hanging fruit anymore. We have to look at these difficult sites mm -hmm. and difficult projects. So um, and feel you, can I? Can I hop in in this too? So, so Mike, that's a policy issue, probably above the, the grade of uh, some of the folks at the health department. And the difficulty here is Suffolk County is a pretty big place and trying to get a countywide policy through the county legislature where, frankly, some of the members are less concerned about this issue than, than others on the East End. You know, it's tough to change a very large geography with one and a half million people. Okay, but so, I hear so could could the estuary program uh, kick off a model program on their well, own? The, 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 I, I can assure you that there have been conversations about uh, piloting or modeling uh, a scenario much like you described in in the Springs area because it's it's a scenario that you have, you know, probably a sixth or, or a fifth of an acre lot, right? And, right. and, and you know, mm -hmm. you, it's really challenging. And we haven't done one of those sort of local community, maybe a hundred systems on one at a time. That might be something that we should try to pilot if there's an interest. I'm happy to have a longer conversation with you about this. Uh, Glynis Berry did some of this work in the Orient area and uh, she looked at the feasibility and the costs and all these other things. And in the end, people don't want to do this in, in a way where they all have to act together uh, so easily. So the irony is it's, it is torturous and painful to imagine this happening one line at a time. But, but the people that have circumstances to begin to take action can on their own and I loved your example, and I'm happy to have a longer conversation about it. And maybe the estuary program can help construct uh, communities that want to have that conversation more completely. I think it's a fine suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Julia, thank you very much. I know thank we're you running so up. I know we're running up to the clock. Uh, is there anything on people's minds? that they want to say or have the, their colleagues here 
before the end of the meeting. And if so, feel free to uh, either raise your hand or or put it in the chat or just jump in and say what's on your mind. Go ahead, Patrice. <laughs> I was following up on Mike's um, suggestion there. We have been having conversations about that locally. And yep. I understand as a um, camp hero, it has, is that is essentially putting in a system like that. And we're waiting, you know, we're watching to see what happens with that project at Camp Hero. Um, the other interesting place is in Hampton Bays, th those um, condos that were built on the canal, <clears throat> they have sort of that similar thing. Um, but the, you know, the, the governance model has to be worked out. That's the big thing. Like, what, you know, we need sewer districts, we need um, ways to pay, pay the maintenance on these. So we really are concerned about it. Um, the other thing is the, the lack of public water it, out here it makes it extremely difficult. We do have small lots encumbered by wetlands in many cases. So we, we don't have, a even though our lot might not look that small, we actually don't have a lot of uh, freedom to place things. So we're, we're just uh, trying to work through it all. And you know, all these ideas are great. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anybody else? Thoughts, observations, concluding remarks? Things you wish you would say before the meeting was over, but are somehow reluctant to, you now have permission. Do we have time for one quick poll? What's the poll? Go ahead. Um, so we were supposed to do a couple of these, but I think this is the most important one. So um, we do a lot of work. PEP does a lot of work um, with homeowners to um, create a, like a more natural yard. Um, we have our homeowner rewards program which if you're curious about, I can tell you um, more about at another date um, to um, kind of rewild some of the yard plant, native plants, um, plant a rain garden. Um, and right now the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan um, folks, Long Island Sound Study, South Shore Estuary Reserve um, and PEP want to have like an aligned um, narrative on how much of lawn we suggest people um, turn natural. Um, so like tearing up their lawns. And I have a quick poll. There's a couple different um, opinions out there. There's a um, movement for two thirds for the birds. So to rewild two thirds of your lawn, there's a 50% um, yard uh, lawn reduction movement and then complete lawn reduction, of course. Um, and then if you have a different opinion, you can um, drop that in the chat as well, but I'm going to launch this poll. So let me know if that works for you all. That was very cool. If, Mike, are you do Mike, are you doing? I don't have a lawn, but I think that that would be too extreme for a lot of people. Uh, very good. Uh, so I, I think two thirds would be awesome. Yeah. If you did say other, if you could drop um, in the chat your what your opinion is, that would be great. I don't have a lawn. That's okay. Did you say other? <laughs> hey, what's left? There you go. So this is not about your own personal yard. It's for our communication to the people of the Peconic Estuary. Hi, this is Debbie. And I have a two acre yard of which there's only a small house on it. So yep. for me to make most of it into non-lawn, and my lawn is mostly weeds, would be very cumbersome for me to keep up. So, for sorry, go ahead, Kevin. No, all I was going to say was uh, thank you, Debbie. I, th I think, you know, there's an, th this is a pretty random assumption. I think the assumption is that most people's jobs are a little smaller. Obviously, if you have a five acre uh, lot in, in the aquifer protection overlay area, two, two thirds of the lots probably already protected. But I, I, this, this is just, we're just trying to find out where people's heads are. So answer it any way you want. And don't, you know, I understand what you're saying.
Um, but I do want to add that um, it doesn't have to be like an overly um, expensive or maintenance heavy project to um, kind of let your lawn even be taken over by like more natural um, processes. Um, so I do have some um, advice from Edwina Van Gaal, who most of you probably know. And um, at Perfect Earth, their opinion is um, for your lawn to allow clover to move in, um, mulch, mm -hmm. mow, and leave grass crip clippings, um, water very seldomly, don't fertilize, um, and to do things like composting. Um, so it doesn't have to be uh, extremely arduous, but um, yeah, we just kind of wanted to get an idea of what everyone thought our messaging should be. And thank you so much for responding to that. So it looks like um, two thirds for the birds um, got the most amount of votes just for your information, you all. Um, but thank you so much for voting. Um, so I think that was the most important poll that we had. Um, if everybody wants to stay on, I can talk a little bit more, but if not, um, we can kind of say our goodbyes up to you. I, I, I'm gonna exercise the chair's prerogative and say, if anybody wants to talk to Valerie, you should, you should email her and, and, and they'll arrange a follow-up. I just don't want to make people feel like we're going to run over and not manage our meeting. So I, I'm, I'm going to suggest that we conclude here, if you don't mind, Valerie. And uh, I don't want to sound like a tyrant, but I know that you know people are busy. So I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank our guests for coming. I want to thank uh, Julia and, uh, and, and Mike. Even Mike gets a thank you, and um, and Julie Wasnowski from the Land Trust for uh, you know some really great information. The staff for uh, helping prepare the meeting and the information. You know, I can I can give you all assurances that um, you know things are going to start ramping up. We have some really exciting opportunities in the program, and uh, and, and with the partnership. And, and with the new staff and some expected new money, uh, this could be a very exciting summer as Omicron and other Delta variants abate. Mm -hmm. And I hope you all have a great spring and we'll see you probably, what, two, two or three months, Valerie? Is that it? Sometime in May? Uh, yes, so our next meeting is actually June 16th. Okay, there you go. All right, so we'll see you all in June. The weather will be much greater, and Byron will be telling us great stories about fish again. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Agreed. All right, guys, thank you all, and uh, have a good night. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.